Um, I was asked to do this in part because I am a mother of seven kids, not quite as many as some of the families in the movie, but uh, all three of my sons did play football, um, and uh, really a lot of athletics in our family, and um, our family's also LDS, we're Latter-day Saints, and of my seven kids, four of them served missions. And so there are kind of a lot of intersecting moments. Our lives are very different from the lives of the families um, shown in this documentary, but, but there's, in a way, some common ground there as well. Um, and I thought it was a, a very touching uh, documentary in so many ways with um, so many themes that intersect with some of our headline news, you know, the, the issue of football and how dangerous of a sport it is. Um, Atticus, who's one of our panelists, is my youngest son, um, but even in the time between when I was raising my children and Addie is 23 years old, um, the knowledge and the information and the dynamics around what football involves has changed so much that my husband and I have often said, would we let our kids play football now? Is that, would we make the same decision? Um, obviously the themes of, of family, this incredible devotion to family, um, their faith, um, and then this uh, sort of um, desirable poison of football. You know, on the one hand, the, the ticket to so many possibilities, that lottery ticket as one of the speakers referred to it, but also <coughs> so many, so many ambivalent um, dimensions to it as well. So those are some of my introductory thoughts, and I'd like to ask each of our panelists to very briefly introduce themselves and maybe their initial reaction to the film, and then we'll do a little discussion here, and then of course we're eager to to have questions and conversation back and forth. So Atticus, yeah. if you can begin. So you got a brief introduction already. My name's Atticus. I'm uh, 23 year, years old. Uh, I played football for about 12 years. Um, I played it up through my freshman year of college, uh, at which point I went on a two-year mission for the LDS Church. Um, and I'm a senior now at Thomas University. I'm a, on the track team there. I'm a thrower. Um, Captain of the track team. <laughs> uh, he's my, my biggest cheerleader. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was me. You know, like, there. I didn't wear a not, tutu. Not quite that big. No tutu. But, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought it was a very interesting film. Uh, a very different experience than what I think many, if not most, high school football players in New Hampshire at least have, I would say, a different experience. Uh, growing up in Bow, it's a small town, so we Football was not nearly the spectacle and the, the event each week in Bo that it, that it was in the film. Um, but I've definitely seen a lot of the themes um, that, that were represented in the film. For example, now at, at Tufts, I mentor a sixth grader in the Cambridge area um, and at the school where he's a student, uh, they're very much the mentality of many of the students there is that they're going to be pro athletes and that's going to be their way to get out of the projects that they're living in. Um, and it is an interesting contrast um, from the good and the bad side of the sports and, of, and of, of sort of that culture that exists in the, the states that uh, for so many people that it's viewed as, as a ticket out of their difficult situations. Um, but I would say for, uh, unfortunately, probably a majority of those people because they focus on it so much and because it's such a selective uh, profession that so few people make it. For many people, they devote too much time into that and, and neglect other areas that would lay a stronger foundation for a, um, maybe a more realistic future. Um, so while I, I can't relate entirely to, to the lifestyle in the film, to the experiences, I do understand it. I maybe fortunately was never a good enough athlete to, to actually seriously consider the NFL or a, a career in pro sports. But, um, but I really thought it was a, a wonderful film, and I'm happy to be a part of the panel here tonight. Uh, my name's Eric Brown. I'm the head football coach at Concord High School. Um, and been there for quite a few years, since 1990. I started my coaching career at Concord head coach for the last seven years. Um, and our experiences at Concord High School is very different than what you see there as far as uh, the NFL dream. Uh, where I think we 
have a much more realistic approach uh, uh, to like you mentioned about what our futures are and, and where we focus uh, our time, academics and what have you. you know, football is a great experience, and I hope you wouldn't let your kids play now. <laughs> but, uh, and I, but on a side note, I did I just want I played in the 1975. Try not to give my age, but the Shrine, the Shrine game yeah. after I, your dad. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I thought it was a great uh, eye opener for me. But um, it was a, di a totally different experience what we have here in, in Clinton. My name is Bob Wolf. the second time I've met him face to face but I, and I've talked on the phone a number of times and it's usually about the refugee kids I deal with refugee kids and what I do is I sign them up for sports range transportation get them uh, athletics gear lots of a lot of kids I've been doing it for 15 years and the parallel I see from the film is that the refugee kids in Concord there's about 450 of them in the schools right now is that they're not trying to get to the NFL necessarily. They're just trying to get integrated into Concord and America and figure America out. And there is one parallel, Eric, the Liberian boys. Because there are no, we have a small number of Liberian boys in Concord, but there are none of them that aren't great athletes, extraordinary athletes, almost all of them. Kid that was on that baseball team that went to the uh, basically the national champions because of the uh, championship, they won everything for the Northern part of the United States, and that was the end of it. Um, Colbert Nemo broke the school, uh, school record. rushing record that, la that lasted for 100 years. His first year as a sophomore, 135, 140 pound kid. Uh, Leo Sulia just left, or he'll, he'll be graduating. Another one, George Taro, the current George Taro does everything. He's a football player, a wrestler, basketball player, played soccer, does everything. He's extraordinary. He's a great kid. He's, uh, he's in the nursing program of some sort. Samu Smith, who somebody told me the other day he's, he's a great baseball prospect. I didn't know that. I know he's a good baseball player, yeah. but they said he's a tremendous baseball prospect. Uh, but he's playing at the Southern, 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 Southern Connecticut. Yeah. So, um, so that's sort of a parallel to the Samoans and the uh, to uh, to Tonkins. Tonkins. It's the Liberian boys. And they, they've been here about uh, all those Liberian boys came here 12 years ago, and Leo and uh, left out John, but Leo, John, and uh, well, Leo and John mostly uh, kept leaving school. My daughter was a one-on-one uh, -on -one aide for uh, George Tarbo, who was like a first grader, and uh, they kept leaving school. They just wandered out of school. Couldn't keep them in school. And they just wandered. I go to pick up Leo for soccer, and uh, I said, say, "Where's Leo?" Because I haven't seen him since this morning. Well, he'd be a mile down the street, so third grader. <laughs> because where they came from, if the kids didn't come home, they'll be hungry. If they get hungry, they'll be home tomorrow, and somebody will take care of them. And Gosh. the way it was. So the mothers were part of this. It took two years to break the mothers and the kids of this habit. The police kept bringing them back. You can't do this. You can't do this. Why not? So that's sort of a Sports for the, the large number of kids that play uh, all kinds of sports. Um, it's a great way for Concord to get integrated to the refugee because the refugee population is getting pretty big. Uh, and it's, it's a two-way street because we have more and more parents
parents and coaches are transporting these kids. And when you get a kid in a car, it's like a psychiatrist couch. All of a sudden, they start telling you things about where they came from earlier in their life. It can be pretty interesting. In fact, during baseball season last year, I, uh, I had a coach come up to me. We were marching in a little league parade. And he said, i got to learn more about this. house and destroyed it. And this guy was flabbergasted. This kid had told him the story in the car, car ride. And, uh, um, and y'all should know that right now people are wondering about uh, the thing on the heights that happened this summer. The, the, uh, the controversy with the Nepalese party next to the neighbor and stuff. And um, there's some controversy there. And there's going to be some meetings February, up on the heights to deal with that, with the uh, police chief and uh, I don't know, a whole bunch of people, community people, and state reps, and so on. But you really need to know that the coaches and the, and the parents are stepping forward in, in numbers I never imagined would happen. I didn't expect it. So, Tom can be pretty, pretty happy about it. Well, um, and thank you for that perspective because, you know, we, we don't, um, I think, recognize the extent to which often um, Concord is becoming a more diverse community and um, some of the pathways to becoming part of the community and really feeling integrated um, for the young people are going to be through those sports teams. And I'd like to sort of ask the panel to talk a little bit about how... Um, how it is that that incredible passion and joy that so many young people experience through sports, you know, that it's just the most satisfying, the most enjoyable, the most engaging part of their lives, how um, does one avoid what we saw repeatedly in this movie, and obviously there are a whole other, lot of other issues, but where, you know, this source of pleasure and joy becomes at the same time um, a source of incredible stress and pressure, both within the family, the expectations there. Um, and, you know, you saw again and again, and I was practically in tears myself, how, you know, these kids um, wanted so much to leverage their talent to kind of bless their families and to, you know, do things for their parents who they felt this debt of gratitude to. And, and how, you know, that mother who on the one hand was just fabulous, you know, she was such a strong woman and beautiful and there with her flag, but at the same time, that was pretty intense when, you know, the whole family's gathered around and she's ripping up the offer from Stanford and saying, you're taking our family to hell, you know, because, you know, the kids smoked a few joints and got into a little bit of trouble. And how, you know, I mean, you know, you're closest to it as a recent athlete, and I almost feel like asking my daughter Sunday, who's here with me as well, who's a, a very serious tennis player, and I think felt sometimes those pressures, so you can jump in if you want to weigh in on that. But And, and as a coach and, and a mentor, how do you help kids keep the joy, um, especially those who aren't probably going to be going to the NFL, um, and not let the, the stress and that family dynamic overwhelm them? I think from my perspective, it's more, you know, having their priorities in the right order. Um, and, you know, if football's a way to get them to college, for the most part, you know, 99 out of 100 kids that come through Concord High School are not going to get paid to play football at a college in the form of a scholarship. Um, so it's a way, you know, if, it, if the joy of football is strong enough, and it's a, and, and we can, you know, obviously, they, like they said, it, they got to keep their grades up if they want to continue to play. And, and if we can get, and get especially, the, you know, some of the refugee refugee kids, um, we can get them there to as a way to improve their lives and get a degree. And most of those kids, I'm sure, their parents have never gone beyond high school, if even gone through high school. So um, that's. I, f I find that that's my most important job. And, uh, forget the X's and O's piece of the, of the coaching thing. It's, uh, trying to get these 
guys to get their priorities in order and, and, and be realistic. And I, I say to Leo today, a senior, you know, we're looking at prep schools. He's not the strongest student, but we're looking at prep schools and some other schools that have uh, support in place for him because he needs that um, academically uh, you know, to get his degree. If you would like to play football at the same time, great, but get a degree. And if you want to help your family, help your family that way. Uh, with your career, your job, whatever it is that you want to do. So that's kind of how I deal with it. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I, as I said, I'm on the track team at Tufts University, which is a great academic school. Um, and it's, it's a D3 program for athletics, so it's competitive, but most people there know that people aren't going to the next level to become pro professional athletes. Um, but as you saw in this movie, how they're, as you said, trying to leverage their talent to, to try and build a, uh, a foundation for their future, the same thing happens at, at a place like Tufts University. There are lots of guys on the track team, um, and when I was on the football team, it was the same way. There are lots of guys there who without their athletic skills wouldn't be able to, to be at Tufts University. They wouldn't have gotten into the school. Um, but they realized that their athletic capabilities would allow them to get into uh, an academic environment that normally would be a little bit out of their, out of their possibilities. But they were able to, to, to get help from the coaches and to get in. And now that they're at Tufts, they're trying to make the most of that opportunity. Um, we live in an incredibly competitive world across every uh, sort of venue nowadays, and people realize that you, you can never really do too much to try and set up um, a good future for yourself and for your family. Um, so even though in our, in our region people might not be looking towards that professional athlete um, goal as much, it is still very much a... Um, there is that, that um, I guess, that mindset to try and make the most of the talents that you have um, to, try and, to try and further and better yourself as much as you can. And that, I think, really has to do with having the, the right perspective and the right priorities um, and realizing realistically what you are capable of. That doesn't mean you can't chase your dreams. Um, but it means that you can't put all your eggs in one basket, and you need to try to uh, to use what you're good at to maybe help help build the yet the other areas where you are weaker and where you can can do better. Um, and I guess that that's what I see um, in my experience as an athlete at Tufts University, where where we're not going to be pro athletes, uh, but for a lot of the people there, they realize that that they wouldn't be Tufts graduates if they weren't good athletes. Um, and they're they're trying to make the most of that opportunity by, uh, by still competing and having fun with that, but, but actually focusing and, and trying to, to really succeed in the classroom and, and set up the future that way. Mm. Um, well, I, I'd like to invite questions. I'll, I'll continue to throw questions at these guys, but I'd like well, to I, <laughs> know. Bob will tell you I have plenty of uh, <laughs> <laughs> respect to um, ask questions. <laughs> what are, one of the observations I would make about the film is to compare it to Friday Night Lights. The filmmaker chose not to do that, but it's very clearly there. And what I'm talking about is not even the NFL goal, or even the college goal, which is now impossible, but the community status goal. There's often just as much pressure, and maybe more, from the very immediate um, kind of thing where the parent's status and community grows, the kid puts all the effort into the high school, and if you see the extended Friday night lights thing, you see all the kids that didn't even make it to college, they were done by the summer after, the end of the summer after their senior, senior year. And I think he left, the filmmaker left some of those parts out to emphasize <coughs> the particular group of kids and that particular motivation. And I'd like to piggyback on that and then ask you um, gentlemen to address it. The most painful 
part of the film for me was Fihi, the one who clearly had an injured knee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, seeing that teen doctor say, what, what was, I can't think of the exact phrase he used. Contusion. Yeah. Well, contusion, but then he said we're, there was yeah. some phrase he, he used. Said, you might have a minor meniscus. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to ignore it or something ignore like that. Ignore it. It's the, the t it's time for now to ignore it. And then seeing, you know, seeing coaches let him go back in when, you know, you did not need to be a doctor to see that he wasn't walking properly. And um, so, yeah, you know, and, and the pressure, but not only for community status, but for kids wanting, you know, not wanting to be held back. I mean, as a coach, how do you deal with that? And I, I said that in the paper the other day. We had, they got interviewed about the whole concussion series that's been in the paper the last few days. And uh, one of the things I said was, I'm, as, a, as a coach, I'm kind of relieved that the decision making with regard to the concussions and all that stuff is completely and 100% out of my hands. Mm -hmm. I have nothing now, to do with it. Now, is that a Concord it. High rule? Is that a New Hampshire Athletic uh, Association rule? It's, no, it's, I mean, it's, for the most part, most New Hampshire schools now, I don't have a number, um, have a concussion protocol, a management protocol. Um, we were one of, we were the first school in New Hampshire to adopt that and get on board with it. And from my perspective, as serious as it's been, it's a blessing for me um, because I, it's out of my hands. And that goes along with any injuries for the most part. I, we have a, you know, doctors on site, trainers there all the time, and they tell me I don't, you know, I, I can't say, well, I think, you know, that you should. That's not a decision that I make. So I'm kind of, I'll just add, going to your question, sort of the, the status in the community and that, I, I, you see that in the film with, uh, I think it was Harvey who was saying when he's, when he does something stupid or when he doesn't do well, all his friends are talking bad about him behind his back. Um, and I think that does tie into sort of the injury question and, um, and coaches and, and athletes trying to, to play through that. And I mean, at, at, at Bo, it wasn't a big thing where if you didn't perform well on the football field that people would, would talk badly about you behind your back. But as an athlete, I, I mean, I remember you, you want to be out there. You don't want to miss plays, especially if you're a big part of the team. Uh, I remember a game in high school where I got hit in the head pretty hard in the second half, but it was a close game against one of our rivals. I didn't know if I had a concussion, but I didn't want to go to the trainer to find out because if I did, he'd take me out of the game. So I was, I was in the game all second half. I played every play. I didn't always remember what happened after the play when I got back to the huddle. Uh, but as an athlete, that's, that's kind of the mentality that you have. They're, they talk about it being war, and you're like a gladiator in there. And when you're in it, you don't want to miss it. Yeah. And it, when you're in it, it feels like the world. It feels like everything. Um, I think it is good that there are broader conversations now about long-term effects of, uh, of concussions and of other injuries. Uh, but it, it's still hard to explain that to a 17 or 18-year-old kid who, who's in the heat of the moment and feels like the whole world is riding on what happens in the next 10 minutes. I'm a graduate of Concord High School, which was certainly very strong at football even back in 57. And I, I You did graduate sons. in 57. Uh, you look too young to have graduated <laughs> in 57. <laughs> and I, uh, I, uh, I always loved football at that stage, but I had three sons. <coughs> and I wasn't very interested in having them get out on the football field because of the aggressiveness of it and the viciousness of the attacks and how quickly, if there was an injury, that person was pegged, and it really disturbed me. And I, as a, a resident of a small community that didn't have football, and suddenly the parents wanted football in the school, and they were all going to get out, and they were, and we didn't have money in Canaan, New Hampshire, and uh, we didn't have that kind of money, but boy, they were going to push for this sport, and they got it. But slowly it's been insidiously coming in, and the taxpayers are going to take pick up on the bill, and you know, and so forth and so on. And my question to you, all of you, is there are so many good sports that you can play all your life that don't crack your skull. <laughs> Why on earth would you encourage your children to play that sport? It's all yeah. cultural. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. Yeah. 
<laughs> for my, as a player, former player and coach, um, there's nothing like it. It's, uh, it's, I don't want, I, without, I can't get any simpler than that. Um, but I'm, I'm sure, you yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that might be hard to understand for a lot of people, but for people who have experienced it, for those who do love it, it's it's something that I don't think you can really get in any other setting. Maybe the only other setting that would that is similar is kind of is combat. It's it's kind of a strange, maybe a primal instinct in humans to kind of let that aggression out and and compete in that way. Um, and it might not seem like a smart decision to to let your kids do it or for you to pursue that, but there is definitely something that draws. Uh, the other thing is, I wanted to mention the one factor in team sports, uh, the movie pointed out, was the camaraderie and the morale building uh, and the moral life lessons. And, uh, uh, you know, that's enough said, I think, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they talked about how, how for some of them it's gangs or it's football, and they're both very much based on violence and danger. And I think that camaraderie really comes through there because you feel like if you let your teammate down, he's not only going to be disappointed in you, but he could be seriously injured. Um, and it really does build strong bonds, and it helps you to – it's it's a great way to, to feel that camaraderie and to really understand what it means to be part of a unit, part of a team, and to have other people rely on you to be responsible and, and help so everyone – here and then there. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Just quickly, I wanted to ask if you feel like the equipment over the years has made a big difference, and can we see into the future that it will continue to improve and make it a safer experience? Yeah, I think there's been drastic improvements over the last 10, 12 years in, in the equipment, specifically the helmets, and now. Um, there's all kinds of uh, the, the heads up tackling. And we're learning tackling techniques to keep the kids safe. Um, you know, and, the, and the officials are, are on it. And the NFL is starting the whole thing. And they, uh, you, know, you can see that in, in the professional level games and, and even college level games. Guys getting thrown out if they're just thrown out of the game if they're using unsafe techniques. Hitting people, so I think in combination with um, the equipment, and that, and now they're even looking at the, the field uh, because that's where a lot of the concussions do happen when your head hits the ground. Um, so they're looking at uh, you know the new turf fields and how worn out some of those can get if they're being maintained and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things in a positive way that you know that I think the that's encouraging the yeah. new techniques. That yeah. It is, and I think for the youth, in, in our youth, and I would be a, a huge proponent, I've talked with Dave Gill in, in the city of Concord who runs a Parks and Rec thing, they're starting, and, and it's growing like crazy, the young, young kids, um, from, I'm talking about like the six-year-olds up through you know, 12 year olds playing flag football. And then when they're 12 years old or 13 years old, they need to start playing, it's like the Canadian hockey. They're, they're, they're not allowed to hit. There's no hitting in hockey until you're like 15, 16 years old. Then the Canadians go a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a huge proponent of not, like with my own children, I, I didn't, they didn't play until they were in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I, I'd have, they'd come to football practice you know, all the time, and we'd drive by the Capitals practices, and, and there'd be tears, you know, in the car because they wanted to play in them. So I'm a big proponent of holding them out and letting them play flag football. I think that's a great thing that's going to be, I think you're going to hear more and more about that. Yeah, the subject's moved a little bit, but as a parent of a multi-sport, kind of back to your question, why would you let your, mm -hmm. um, as a parent of a multi-sport athlete, uh, wasn't a huge fan of football. I didn't play football. When my son got into it, and I'm sure there's bad programs out there, but here at Concord with Coach Brown and and the, the entire athletic department. Um, you know, not all 
peer pressure is bad. There was peer, peer pressure to make sure your grades were where they need to be, that you didn't get in trouble. Um, but also the sense of discipline and the, the need to support your teammates, both physically, health-wise, to stay healthy, to do well, do well in school. Um, watching this whole Concord football program has been an amazing thing to watch. Yeah, you hate to see kids get hurt, but I've seen the pros far out. I didn't see a whole lot of positive peer pressure. I saw more negative peer pressure, but there's definitely positive peer pressure. Much better. Um, one question that I kind of wanted to pose to you, Atticus, um, because they don't go into it too much in the film, but you did have that experience of sort of leaving your kind of collegiate athletic career to go take two years and serve a mission. Um, and how did that factor into your decision not to go back to football and to switch to track and um, and how much of a mind shift and emotional shift and even physical shift was it to you know sort of pull pull back from that collegiate athletic environment yeah so my my freshman year at Tufts I was on the football team and the track team um, and then after my freshman year I took two years off and I was in Hungary serving a I think you might the, describe what that involves. Really yeah, so it's it's a, a proselytizing mission. So you're out, you're preaching, you're talking to people on the street, you're knocking on doors and, and trying to, to see if anyone's interested in in learning about the church. Um, so it's that they can I mean, there are documentaries about those two. That's a whole other subject that you can go into. Um, I would say that my I think sort of my planning and preparation for for going on a mission. Um, was a little different than what you saw in the movie because um, I would say largely because of my two older brothers who had both, they were both college athletes at what, as well, but I saw them leave college for two years and go serve a mission. So it was very much a part of my plan going in. Um, it wasn't uh, a decision that I came to in my first year of college, but it was more something I had planned on. Um, but as to how it relates to football and, and not continuing with back, I would say it definitely factored in. Um, one of the big factors for why I didn't continue playing football after my mission was that the Tufts football team was um, was very bad. <laughs> and my freshman year, it had, it had been a, a big commitment doing football and track and field. It, it basically meant I didn't have any free weekends all year. And, um, so part of it was that. But I would say definitely part of it was being away from uh, away from football, away from sort of the aggression and um, sort of combative elements of it and maybe mellowing out because of that. Um, that's not to say that I don't miss that a lot now. I have lots of friends on the football team at Tufts and, and anytime I go to the games I do miss putting the pads on and I do miss hitting and I miss, I miss all of that. Um, but I think for me and for a lot of people um, when they take the two years and kind of get away from it, um, for some people in that time they realize that um, maybe beforehand they thought they were going to go pro or they thought they were going to be a scholarship athlete and over the two years their interests change. Um, but for me that was definitely a factor. I decided that I'd focus on track and school and uh, hang up the cleats so to speak. It was nice not being sore from football, that's one thing that that football players uh, experience is a lot of soreness. Um, so I don't miss that part of it. I do miss I do miss putting on the helmet and the shoulder pads and, and getting to play a good hit on someone. But um, the two years away definitely did maybe temper my, my desire. <laughs> you should point out though that the movie is a little bit misleading in that it's, it's not in the school's interests. When BYU was approaching being a national power and a famous coach, <coughs> they strongly encouraged students to take the mission yeah. early on. Mm -hmm. So they would be playing with players whose juniors and seniors were 23, 24, 25. Yeah, there are mm -hmm. pros and cons from the athletic perspective. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a 23-year-old senior now, so hypothetically I'll have a little bit more maturation 
um, physically. Um, for a lot of programs that aren't as familiar with two-year missions, they don't want their athletes kind of leaving for that long period and getting out of the lifting program and all of that. Um, but I think, I think on the whole, for people who, who go on the mission and come back still very much committed to, to playing whatever sport it is, it's definitely, a, I would say, a pro because they come back, they have a much wider sort of life experience. They're more mature individuals. Um, I think they, they do understand sort of, they have a better perspective on, on kind of what matters ultimately. So they're able to be maybe more level-headed athletes. They're able to um, be better leaders on the team. So I think on the whole, it is a very positive thing for an athletic program to have athletes who have had that experience. Um, but for, for schools that aren't as familiar with the process, I think it's just a little bit of a, uh, a daunting thought to kind of lose control of their athletes for two years and not be able to be there and, and having them develop as they kind of have everyone of course, you toss these four of them. Yeah, yeah, they're much more familiar with it there. I, I think uh, some of the California schools, they have a good number of Mormon athletes coming through as well. Um, but definitely out here on the East Coast, um, in the middle of the country, it's a much rarer thing for their athletes. Any? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, the high. Mr. Wolf, um, as a parent of. Um, coach here in Concord for the middle school program and a volunteer coach for the city of Concord. What do you coach? Basketball. <laughs> middle school. We've been emailing. My question to you is, what can we do for the Concord kids, the new Americans who aren't making it to the basketball practices and their, their program? What can we do as a community? To you asked the man. You're one of the ones emailing me about not, not getting all the kids? Yes. Okay. I just okay. registered 80 refugee kids. No, we're not um, seeing you. And uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm retired, but every morning I get up, and that's all I do all day is figure out how I'm going to get them all to your practices. It takes so me all day. And I'm not always successful. I'm down to about one kid today, huh. maybe two, that I haven't uh -huh. figured out. Um, but once you're, say again? What, what, can, what can we do as a community to help support your mission and get these kids to the basketball court? You're saying you physically have to drive them there? I, I arrange that. I do a lot of it myself. I have retired people. Retired people seem to be the only ones that have the <laughs> flexibility to do it. To get these kids. Over the years, I've tried a lot of different program. people. To, to get them there. I have some retired people. And they're dependable. Two or three. Um, mm. And hopefully they have big cars. One guy just uh, traded in his four-person you know, four pickup for a, a new Toyota 8-passenger. Just because he loves doing it. <laughs> Great. Uh, All right. I need uh, to know who this yeah. is. <laughs> I was retired math department chairman at Concord High. Okay. Um, we'll continue email. But I thought since But to answer your high. question, yeah. it's that's what I was trying to say. It's happening okay. big time because I'll give you an example. Last spring, I took about 22 kids off the heights um, because the Little League on the other side of town said they tape them. Um, the guy that said he'd take him uh, was the bus manager for the Concord school system. He was dealing with a few kids more than trying to get more of them than I did. And uh, I said, you know, we got this problem of getting them across the river at rush hour to the practice of the games. He said, we'll figure it out. We always do. I said, okay. So we registered them, and I had 14 kids on eight teams eight of the nine teams that were called AAA, that's the one below the, the big guy, the big 12 year olds. And I didn't go to draft night and I made a mistake. I, should, I, I said, I, I need to go to draft night so I don't get too many onesies or, you know, I can't have ones, people driving <coughs> onesies across the river because it's not kosher. You do it when you have to, but you don't want to do it on a regular basis. So I didn't go to draft night and they put a, I had, Two kids on 14 teams. So that wasn't. So I said, This isn't going to work. You're going to have to redo this. And they said, We're not going to redo it. I said, You have to. And they said, they, So the result was they had a coaches' meeting, and the coaches said that they would do it. 
And I laughed because they, you know now, because you started. Yeah. But they don't know. The phones don't work. Right. The parents <coughs> don't <laughs> speak English. And if they speak English, they just say, yes, yes, yes. And they have no idea what you're talking about. Exactly. The kids get home, and they're off into those apartment complexes. They're gone. Uh -huh. You can't find them half the time. And then you've got to fight that darn Pizza Hut light. Yes. Five o'clock, and then you gotta get down, get down the other side of the road. That takes forever, right? And it was all this, all this crazy stuff. And so some of them, you know, getting them out of the schools. And so you got to arrange that with right. Sue Farrell at Project Twenty One, Century Twenty. So it's all these, and I just laugh. I'm like, this ought to be good watching this. And and, and they're not going to do it. They're going to try, and then they're going to quit because it's just it's too darn frustrating. Well, guess what? Of the eight teams that had kids, all eight coaches did it. Just all kinds of people, doctors, Good. lawyers, That's mechanics, so all wonderful. kinds of people. Terrific. I never expected it. That's they did it all year. That makes find the same, good. I'm finding the same thing with you basketball people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, what's your last name? Kingsley. Oh, okay. I'm You're the, I, I'm to what color are your shirts on your purple. team? I think we're playing you on Saturday morning. <laughs> should be proud. I'm, I'm sure. I never expected this, what I'm getting. Yeah. It's funny, the story you just related, we used to do with Leo back in AAA baseball. Yeah. Knocking on the door. Come on, Leo. Oh, it's time to go? Yeah. 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 He was just a wanderer. A lot. Yeah. He was a wanderer. Well, yeah, and then I'll catch up with you on Leo later. Yeah. Well, it makes us feel good to hear both of you talk yeah. about this commitment on the part of just so many people to make it possible for these kids to be part of something that will be really important in their lives and in, in their experience of, of finding a home here and feeling at home and feeling part of the community. Um, I know that there's a State of the Union tonight. Yeah, and maybe guess. some of you might want to <laughs> want to catch that. So if there aren't any any more questions, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming out. Thank our wonderful panel.